There are so many individuals in so many churches today that do not know anything about fasting. There are Christians who have never fasted for anything, or if they fast, or if they know of fasting anyways, they think it's just food. And that could be what happens with many, but it isn't all there is to fasting. Today I want to give you the word of God on that subject, and then at the end of this message, for those that are gathered here, we will be passing out another couple things that will define what fasting is, when to do it, and the different fasts that are in the Word of God. In fact, there are ten different kinds of fasting in the Word of God, and there are many reasons to fast. The Word of God makes it very clear. A person, first of all, understands the whole counsel of God on every subject, and then the person goes to God and says, do you want me to fast for something? If you do, please put it upon my heart. Fasting is not something you do, like take an offering every week or do the Lord's Supper every month, as many churches do. Fasting is something the Holy Spirit puts upon you that this particular situation will only come about through prayer and fasting. So it is important for us to deal with this subject because it's taught all the way through the Old Testament and it was practiced and taught in the New Testament. So it tells us that it is for the believer today. Of all the spiritual disciplines, the probable understanding of fasting is the lack of in the Word of God for many Christians. They have never heard a message on it. If they have, it's been one in 25,000 years, and they don't know what it's all about. We have preached on fasting once in our entire ministry because that's when God led us to. And then he said this week, I want you to define it even more so so that your people will search it out and those listening by way of the Internet or public access will search it out and find out what the Word of God says on that subject and then let the Holy Spirit lead them as to whether they are to do a fast for any situation. Now, when a person fasts, it's not a self-denial situation. It is a situation where you feel you're not as close to God as you want to be. You do not have the joy of the Lord. You do not have the peace that passes all understanding. You do not have faith that God is going to take care of your situation, your problem, that all things work together for good to them that love God. You don't have that, and you want it. So fasting in that situation is because you want to understand God better than you've ever understood God and really get closer to God than you feel you are right now. Despite all our current unfamiliarity with fasting, it was there for a common practice in the Old and the New Testament. Moses fasted for 40 days when he was on the mount receiving the Ten Commandments. Listen to the word of God in Exodus 34. Exodus 34, and it is verse 28. Moses was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights without eating bread or drinking water. And he wrote on the tablets the word of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. God led Moses to not eat or drink for 40 days and 40 nights. They say you can't go without water that long. When God leads you to do that, you can do that, and you can do it in a healthy way. But you see what he is trying to say there is God was preparing Moses to receive the law of God. 
not to take it lightly, but to take it seriously and to give it to the people because God wanted them to know what his laws were. Not that they could keep them. He knew they couldn't keep them, but they were asking for it, and so he gave them, if you're going to be saved by law, this is what you must do. And they could not do it in any sense of that term. Queen Esther asked the Jews to fast before she approached the Persian king on behalf of the people. And the word of God makes it very clear in Esther 4, 16, they did, and she accomplished what God wanted her to accomplish. She was prepared because the people fasted for her in her approach to the king, who if he didn't beckon them, it was all right to come in as a queen, she would be put to death. But the king was favorable toward her because of the fasting of God's people. It was necessary. It was not something that could be either done or not done. God put it on her heart to ask them. They did it, and God gave the blessing. And then when Jesus fasted 40 days before his ministry, we read that in Matthew 4, 14, verses, uh, 20, verse 23, excuse me, Well, that's not there, but it says that anyways in that particular reference. Jesus fasted, and he fasted so that he would have the power of the Father. Remember, he was God-man on this earth, but he relied upon his Father for everything, God the Father. So he fasted in order, and he's the Son of God. He felt it necessary to get closer to his father in his humanity. And he did. And he was able to ward off the temptations of the devil. God says very clearly in that instance, Jesus could not have done it without depending on his father. We cannot do anything without depending on our father. And our father is our heavenly father. And therefore, in cases like that, where you're going to have to stand up for righteousness, and you know there is a, uh, there's a, a, a payment if you do that. Somebody's not going to like it. There is a beautiful pastor of the Baptist Church, and uh, he's Pastor Jeffers. And some of you know of him. He preaches the word of God as the word of God and does not worry about people sending him messages and threatening his life. He simply preaches the word of God, and I believe that man knows what it is to fast. He's close to God. So Jesus knew that he had to set an example, an example for God's people to follow. The early church relied on this practice of fasting in asking the Lord's guidance for important decisions. In Acts 13, verse 2, we read this. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. A person, if they're going to know what God wants, not what seems reasonable, what seems the thing to do, but what does God want in this situation, must fast in order to hear God because there's so many other voices screaming at us in this time in which we live. We need to hear from God. They did, and God had told them through fasting Select Barnabas and Saul for the preaching of the word of God. And then in Acts 14, verse 23, we read these very important words. Listen to them from God's word. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church with prayer 
and fasting. They never appointed anyone in the churches without having prayed and fasted. Very interesting. Committing them to the Lord in whom they put their trust. So every move has to be in a situation where it's very much got to be God's will, not my will, should begin with prayer and fasting. No decision, important decision, should be made without knowing it's coming directly from God. Now understand, and you're going to see that later in the duration of it. Now the scriptural evidence should cause us, therefore, to give serious consideration to the importance of fasting. But Jesus never offers a more important incentive than in, in his teaching than praying and fasting in many situations. Listen to this reference, Matthew 6, verse 16 to 18. When you fast, when you fast, do not look somber, long-faced, as the hypocrites do. That's what the Pharisees were doing. They were looking somber. They wanted people to know they were fasting. But he says, when you and I fast, if we fast, don't disfigure your faces to show that you're fasting. Truly, I tell you, you have received your full reward. Poor you. But when you fast, put oil on your head, which symbolizes the Holy Spirit, and wash your face. Don't even appear to be fasting so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting. It's a personal thing. It's a private thing many times. But only your Father will know you're fasting, your Heavenly Father, who is unseen, and your Father who sees what is done secretly will reward you openly. So what is he saying here? He's saying fasting is not something that is for the Old Testament or for the New Testament. It's for every believer. But when I fast is according to what God wants me to do and leads me to do. Note on the screen, if you will, number one. He begins by saying, whenever you fast, not if you fast. Whenever you fast, not if you fast. He's taking it for granted that you're going to fast as a Christian at times in your life. He goes on to say in that point, this implies that fasting should be a vital part of the Christian's life. Now, you and I have to go to God and see what part it is and when we're to do it and how we're to do it because God knows those things. In fact, the context, if you read the context of this teaching, it includes instructions on giving and prayer. We give and we pray. Therefore, he's saying with the same quality of evidence, I want you to fast at times in your life. None of us would exclude either of these other acts if we're going to obey God, that is, giving in prayer. But why does the church seem to think that fasting is for the Old Testament or for the New Testament saints and isn't for them? It, of course, is for us, but it has to be led by the Spirit. We do the Lord's Supper, communion, whenever the Holy Spirit leads us to do it, some do it every month. It is not necessary to do these things every month because what you do is you get used to them and it don't mean what it should mean to you. But you need to do it when the Holy Spirit directs you to do it or directs the leadership to do it. It is something that the Holy Spirit tells us to do. So it is 
with fasting, my friends. So it is with fasting. Number two on the screen, if you will. The most basic meaning of fasting, the basic meaning is abstinence from food. Abstinence from food. People make food their God. Now, some people don't, but by the looks of many people in our world that are plump, it is because they eat too much. It is more important to them than prayer in many cases in the Christian church. Not all people that are plump are plump because they have eaten too much. Some, it's glandular. But I'm talking about those kinds of people that value food to the point where it is a comfort to them and they keep eating and eating and eating and you see the evidence of it. He's saying to us, God is saying to us, make the spiritual things of the word of God more important than the physical things in the word of God. In other words, the whole call of God to fast and fast a meal or fast several meals, whatever God wants you to do in that case, if that's the type of fasting he wants you to do, should not be a problem. It should be easy to do it when you're doing it by God's direction. I remember the time I did it in my life. It was really hard for the first two days, but it wasn't hard after that. And when God said the fast is over, I fastly found the food. But the reality is this. Once you get into doing what God says to do, whether it's by prayer or prayer and fasting or whether it's in another area what God says to do, it is hard at the beginning because Satan fights it. But then God begins to take over, and it's not hard at all. I can tell you Moses probably did not have a problem after the first two days, fasting for 40 days. Jesus certainly didn't have a problem after perhaps the initial time because <coughs> he was perfect human. But God makes it clear Satan will fight when you fast because the purpose of fasting is getting closer to God so you can hear God better than you've ever heard in all your life. We often do what our feelings tell us to do rather than what God tells us to do. And we must hear the word of God and do that what he tells us to do. It might be for one meal. It might be giving up something else in our life. But it's for a season. It's to prepare you to have time to be with God. Give up a TV program and start praying. That's a fast. That's a fast. You give up several TV programs in a row and pray in place of those for the time frame God gives. It happens to be what God knows is more important to you than he is. So he'll tell you to give it up for a season and get to know him. Number three, no matter what the form, the common denominator is an attitude of humble petition before God. Humble petition before God. When God told me that I was going to be pastor here for the rest of my life, I believe, I had to humble myself before God and do what God told me to do. And that meant I had to know it was God that told me to do that. It wasn't me that told me to do that. And I can truly tell you it has not been me for a long time because God is the reason I'm here today. And it's the reason you're here if you're here today. And it's the reason you're watching TV. You want God to speak with you. And so you're glued to what God says in his word. And it's not just this program. It's any program that teaches you the precious and holy word of God. 
What does fasting accomplish? Fasting isn't a diet plan. Some people say, well, at least I'll lose weight. That is not the reason for dieting or for fasting, excuse me. It's not a magic bullet to get what you want from God. I'll show God how serious I am. I'll give up my donut every day. And God says you'll have to give up a lot of donuts every day <laughs> if you think that's going to get you serious with me. Fasting is meant to move you closer to God, not to give you a diet or a way to move God because God says you've got to suffer in order to get that prayer. That's not what God says at all. Nor is it for the purpose of seeking forgiveness. You can't fast to seek forgiveness for the blood of Christ has given you already forgiveness. So it has nothing to do with asking God to forgive you for some sin in your life. That's not the reason. God's already taken care of that. He just wants you to open that door and to fellowship with him, to hear him, and be led by the Spirit, not by situations and circumstances that you may experience. Number four, the goal of prayer and fasting is to bring our natural, physical desires under the control of the Holy Spirit for the purpose of hearing God. I want to hear God. If you want to hear God and not yourself or somebody else's ideas, if you want to hear God, you'll do anything in order to hear God. And God says, remove what's in the way of you taking time to be with me. That's a fasting. And once you do that, by the way, and you get free from that situation, you get close to God, Whatever you gave up doesn't matter anymore. You don't really desire it like you used to desire it. It is something that takes its place, but it doesn't take first place in your life at all. The Word of God makes it very clear. Prayer and fasting bring you closer to God if you desire to get closer to God. You know, I say that because some Christians, <laughs> they're satisfied with being at arm's length from God. It doesn't, it doesn't require much if they keep him at that distance. But if he comes and lives in your heart and takes over you, it requires you to die daily to everything that this world has for you, all your flesh has for you. Number uh, five, number five. When Christ instructed his followers about fasting, his focus was not on the method or the duration, but on the appropriate attitude. It wasn't on the method or the duration, but it was on getting God's attitude. I can't tell you, and neither does Jesus tell you, neither does the Old Testament or New Testament tell you how long your fast should be. God has to give that to you. Because God, he knows what he wants to do in our lives. If we're brought closer, shorter time, then it doesn't take as much time. But if we are stubborn, and Christians are stubborn too, I don't know if you know that, but Christians can be very stubborn. They want to do things their way. And if I submit to God earlier, I will not have to go through fasting longer. But if I don't, God's going to require a longer fast from me. Fasting should never be done to show off one's devotion to Christ. Our home base ministry in Baltimore, Maryland, asked the people to fast every Wednesday for the ministry. But they don't 
watch to see if you did it or how you're doing it. And they haven't, they haven't said you've got to do it a certain way. They have said just if you're going to fast, do it with us and do it silently and secretively. In other words, it isn't paraded at all. But it's a body desire to do that for the outreach of God's people. Fasting should never be done then to, for, to show your devotion to Christ, but to get closer to him. It's supposed to be a time of intimate, private fellowship with the Lord. Just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. It isn't a talk with somebody else. It's a talk with Jesus. And that comes through many times through being so serious with God you fast and pray for a period of time. Jesus advises us to keep our fasting quiet rather than announce it openly. The point is it's between you and God, not between you and others. Number six, the goal is simple, and it's really simple to seek God, to seek God. How many people will seek God outside of prayer and fasting? How many? You know that most people seek God, and if he doesn't tell them what they want to hear, then they just simply dismiss what was told them and say, I couldn't have heard that right. But when you seek God, God is going to begin to show you his will, his purpose, his joy, his contentment, his long-suffering. He's going to show you all those things so that you will know you're receiving it, so give it to others. He is our example. When we sacrifice for him, we, he delights in us and he promises a future reward. And I want that future reward, don't you? Although there are many occasions for fasting, I think they can be summed up with three basic uh, reasons for fasting. And I want to give those to you. Number one is seven on the screen. First, for cleansing. I fast for cleansing. I feel I have wandered away from God. I'm not the person I should be. I, I have sinned in areas and dismissed it as I'm just human, like that old song, I'm only human. Well, God doesn't want you to act human, even though you are human. Act according to God's plan for your life, which is supernatural. So I have to go to God. I have to say, Lord, if there's anything in my life that is an unclean spirit or an attitude or a sin, please show it to me and deal with it. In the course of time, sinful habits and attitudes can take up residence in us without us even knowing it. We can watch a program and dismiss it as, well, this is reality, and we know it's not the kind of program we should watch. After a while, that desire to watch such a program is there without any hindrance. We begin to think, well, it, it's just got a couple bad things in it, but I'll keep watching it. It dulls our sense toward righteousness, and what that is doing is dirtying up our walk with God. Hidden sins slowly fill the cracks of your spiritual life and my spiritual life, much like dust accumulates in a house that is not clean. It's a strange thing, my friends, but periodically the sun shines on our stove back. The, it's black, and you can see dust that is thick on it, and I can't see it when the sun doesn't shine on it. So I begin to clean it. I didn't know that was accumulating there. 
And that's the same problem we have in our lives. We don't know how living in this world accumulates wicked thoughts, sins, attitudes in our life. And God says, I must receive a cleansing for those things. They're so gradual that I don't know they're there until it becomes so dirty, it's very clear, I got a problem. In the same way, fasting opens our eyes to see ourselves from God's perspective. Example, Isaiah, great man of God in the word of God, tremendous word of God. He saw God and he said, I'm unclean. I'm undone. I, I have unclean lips. He didn't see that before he got a real picture of God. And if I go into fasting and get a real picture of God without the cleansing coming before that, going to God and say, cleanse thou me from secret fault sins, then I'm going to experience the same thing that Isaiah did because there's a lot of dirt, a lot of sin, a lot of bad thoughts, a lot of bad attitudes that accumulate over the years, and I didn't even know they were there until I met that closer walk with God. So we need a cleansing process, a cleansing process. God promised that he'd give us that if we would seek it, but if we don't know it's there, how can we seek it? Then number eight, second, not only for cleansing, but for guidance, for guidance. Perhaps the most frequent reason people first, uh, people fast, excuse me, is to re the reason that God directs them for a decision or a situation. They fast to know what God wants me to do in this situation or that situation. He may say, stand still. Just stand still. He may say, you've got to deal with that situation. And then you have to ask God, how do I deal with it? And God will guide you and direct you through the Holy Spirit. He lives within us. But God is the one that's going to give us guidance through his Holy Spirit. But if I really don't get close to God, I don't know I need guidance. I think I'm big boy now. I can do this myself. I don't need to hold your hand. I'm, I've been a Christian for so long that I can't remember when I got to be one. It must have been 100 years ago. My family were Christians. See, the attitude is this. I don't know what God wants me to do until I get close to God and God shows me what to do. And then I do it because God showed me what he wanted. He promised to instruct us and teach us in the way we should go, Psalm 32, verse 8. Sometimes we can't hear his voice until we diligently seek him through prayer and fasting. You can't hear a still small voice unless you're attuned to it. And you can't get attuned to it unless you have got close to God and you hear him speak to you in that still, small voice. God does not shout. He doesn't need to. If he's going to get my attention, he's going to be quiet. Now, if I'm too quiet with this mic, it doesn't go over too well, so I can't. But the reality is this. God wants to get our attention and say, you are not what I want you to be. This is what I want you to be. You've got only so many days left. Won't you get close to me? And if it comes by prayer and fasting, won't you do that in order to hear from me so that I can use you in a way you've never been used before? 
I can clean you up with the filth that has get, got there that you don't even know about. I can give you guidance for my Holy Spirit, and you'll follow it because you're not thinking, well, this might be God or this might not. You know it's from God. And by the way, it always lines up with the Word of God. Number nine. The third reason is for deliverance and protection. I fast and pray for deliverance and protection. Trouble is another occasion for fasting. Anytime we find ourselves in a helpless situation, what do you do, panic? No, you don't panic. We should follow the example of King Jehoshaphat. I always thought that was an interesting name. I remember there was a king, and I don't know whether it was Jehoshaphat or not, but somebody stabbed him and the fat rolled around it. They couldn't find it. It wasn't him. Well, uh, that always <laughs> told me that uh, he should have reduced. He, he certainly didn't listen to God. But in Second Chronicles 20, we have this example. When Judah was threatened by three powerful enemies, way beyond their ability to cope, Jehoshaphat called the entire nation to fast and cry out for God's deliverance. They were in a troublesome situation, in a difficult situation, and they needed desperately to have God intervene so they fasted as a nation, and God delivered them. God came to the rescue, it says, and time after time throughout the word of God, the Lord protected his people when they have humbled themselves in prayer and fasting. The nation of America needs to humble itself in prayer, in fasting of one type or another. It has to be God's choice, but they need to humble themselves and pray. We need to humble ourselves and pray and fast according to God's direction if that be the situation in our life. Number 10, fasting then is a privilege that helps us draw nearer to the Lord. Fasting is a privilege that aids us, helps us to draw closer to the Lord. The reality is this. That song is very true. Just a closer walk with thee. I cannot say I'm as close to the Lord as I ought to be. I won't be until I see him face to face, but I should get closer all the time. I should not be satisfied that I'm close enough until I have all that God says a Christian can have, joy, peace, long-suffering, all those fruits of the Spirit. I'm not close to the Lord as God wants me to be. I want to get that close to God, don't you? It's the attitude of every believer. Number 11, fasting, fasting also reveals Who's in control? Who's in control? We think we're in control, but we're not. We think we're in control when we uh, don't pray. So we don't pray. We don't need any help. We're not in control. We think that somebody else is in control. They're not in control. Only God is in control. Have you viewed prophecy lately? Every prophecy that predicts what's going to happen before the tribulation has and is being fulfilled today. Who's in control? Is Washington? No. Is some other foreign leader? No. It is God that's in control. And we must never forget that. And if I'm going to know how God is in control and not be obsessed with what's happening in our nation, I'm going to have to get close to God so he can tell me how he's in control. Because he is. He is. We would not exist as a ministry if God wasn't in control. 
but God is in control. We would not be on Facebook or YouTube or public access if God wasn't in control, but God is in control. We would not have miracle finances in this ministry if God wasn't in control, but God is in control. You see, whether you think he's out of control or not, he's still in control. God is supreme. If you seek God's direction with true humility, my friends, he'll clean up your life and begin to work through you with his almighty power because he's in control. You'll discover fasting produces an amazing sense of oneness with the Lord. Teaches us that we can only live a life that glorifies God if we hear how to live that life according to God's will. I cannot predict what God will do in your life, but I know one thing for certain, and I repeat this to you, what you ultimately gain will be far more than the sense of what you gave up. You will get more of God himself. Now, what we're going to be passing out, I just want you to know, and we'll pass that out after we're off television, the reasons for prayer and fasting. And I'm just going to repeat it. The scriptures are down here for you to look up. But these are the ten reasons. Number one, to strengthen prayer. Two, to guide God's guidance. So seek God's guidance, excuse me. Three, to express grief. Four, to seek deliverance or protection. Five, to in express repentance and a return to God, to express it to God. Six, to humble oneself before God. These are all taught in the word of God with the references. Seven, to express concern for the work of God. Eight, to minister to the needs of others. Number nine, to overcome temptation and to dedicate yourself to God. And ten, to express love and worship to God. Now, I'm not going to read this, but I want you to know you will receive this as well. Ten different types of facts about fasting in the Bible. There's the disciples' fast, there's Ezra's fast, all these fasts with the scriptures, and it explains it. If you're interested in this subject of fasting, knowing that it is something God has put there for his people to get closer to him, you'll read those things and you'll see God in regard to if God's calling you to some kind of a fast. Remember, it may be of food, it may be of things, it may be of uh, programs, it may be a whole bunch of things, but whatever God calls you to do, you're not taking the easy road out, you're doing what God wants you to do in regard to that. And I can promise you, according to what I've read in this and searched out, if God calls me to fast and I do it, it's going to give me a blessing of intimacy with God that I have never experienced. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word on the doctrine of fasting. We thank you, Lord God, that it is your word. We don't have to doubt, is it for today? It's for all time on this earth. And we pray that, Lord God, you will guide every one of us that hears this message, what we're to do with your word in regard to fasting. And then, Father, may we do whatever you guide us and direct us to do for the glory of God and for the well-being of each one that does it. Now, bless, Lord God, your word in Jesus' name. If you've never received Christ as your Savior, we know and you know we never stop our program without giving you the opportunity to receive Jesus Christ 
as your Lord and Savior, were born sinners only through receiving Jesus into our life, asking him to forgive our sins, come into our life, and be our Lord God. Can we be sure of heaven? If you haven't done that, I encourage you to do that right now. Just say this prayer to God. Dear Father in heaven, forgive me for all the things I have done that you call sin. Cleanse me by your grace, and by your grace save me. Come into my life and make me one of your children. I pray this in the matchless, holy name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. If you've done that, please let us know. Write to us at the Bible Speaks, 40 Belvedere Street, Lakeport, New Hampshire, zip code 03246, or email us at rhornet2 at metricast.net. God bless you until we meet again.